Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. It's time for our new show this week in Israel where we'll give you the scoop on everything you need to know about the last seven days right from Tel Aviv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here to keep you informed. The army has just located and killed the Palestinian terrorist who is now believed to have killed Rabbi Razael Shevach. Rabbi Shevach was tragically murdered last week in a drive-by shooting near the West Bank city of Nablus. And so far, two Israeli police officers have reportedly been wounded after arresting two other suspects in the rabbi's murder. Israeli police border police Yamam Shabak counterterrorism operation took place overnight in Jenin. We search for the terrorist who carried out the murder of the rabbi from Judea and Samaria that was murdered on the 9th of January, Rabbi Raziel. The terrorists were found and a gun battle took place overnight. Israeli leaders are praising the security forces' quick work in apprehending and neutralizing the alleged killers. The army has been on an intense manhunt for over a week now, finally tracing the suspect to the Palestinian city of Jenin. A violent gunfight erupted between Israeli troops and the suspects, leaving one suspect killed. That suspect's name is Ahmed Jarrar, who it turns out is the son of a top Hamas official who was also killed by Israeli troops during the Second Intifada. Prime Minister Netanyahu, though currently in India, also took time from his trip and commended the army's work. He says it symbolizes a serious warning to future would-be terrorists that there's nowhere to hide. The suspect's death has also raised some red flags, though, because it echoes the calls for revenge that landed an IDF soldier in jail just earlier this week. That soldier distributed flyers at an IDF enlistment center, brandishing the IDF's logo, demanding that the rabbi's murderer be killed in revenge. He also called for the re-establishment of the controversial and disbanded Unit 101 that was solely focused on reprisal attacks against Palestinian terrorists. That soldier was arrested for incitement to violence. Well, there's a new question mark on President Trump's plan to move the American embassy to Jerusalem as to when the move is actually going to happen. While Prime Minister Netanyahu has one answer, the White House seems to have another. ILTV's Brett Allen Smith has more details on what this means for the future of the embassy. Thanks, Natasha. Well, originally, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson estimated that it would take at least another three years to move the embassy from Tel Aviv, and that's because the administration apparently plans on building a new embassy from scratch, and that's obviously going to take some time. So it came as a bit of a shock when Netanyahu told reporters he expects the move to finish by the end of this year, a claim that Trump himself has actually just contradicted, telling reporters flat out, by the end of this year, no. Well, clearly Israeli leaders are a little anxious for the embassy promise sure. to become a reality, but this entire question of Jerusalem and the move is kind of the center of the entire discussion right now. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this actually comes at a really interesting time. It's kind of a turning point for everyone involved, Israel, the United States, and the Palestinians. I mean, summing up that paradox is the fact that Vice President Pence is finally coming to the region soon for peace talks after rescheduling twice, but not that the Palestinians nor top Christian leaders have agreed to meet with him at all because of Trump's Jerusalem decision, which is why some people are kind of asking, you know, what's the Vice President even going to do while he's here? So it's definitely an interesting crossroads, as you'll see now in the rest of my report. Prime Minister Netanyahu raised hopes by suggesting that the White House had fast-tracked its plan to relocate the embassy to Jerusalem in less than a year, a much shorter timeline than the three years initially estimated by U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson shortly after President Trump's controversial decision was first announced. But now it looks like Netanyahu may have jumped the gun a bit. Trump appears to have just contradicted the Prime Minister's timeline, telling reporters, quote, By the end of the year, we're talking about different scenarios. We're not really looking at that. That's no. End quote. Netanyahu's office has since clarified the prime minister's remarks, claiming that Trump and Netanyahu aren't saying anything different, but that the White House is taking interim measures into consideration for expediting the embassy move. The decision itself continues to ignite fierce international debate, so regardless of when the embassy does physically move, it'll surely be another ripple in the discussion. Making good on an earlier promise, the Trump administration has now just frozen over over half of its funding to the UN's Palestinian Refugee Organization. Though Israeli leaders are hailing this as a bold new approach, both human rights activists and the United Nations warn that it could greatly threaten regional stability, as well as the dignity of Palestinians all over the world. 
President Trump first threatened to slash aid to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, after the Palestinians announced that they'd no longer see the United States as an impartial peace negotiator for the Middle East. That prompted the United States to re-examine its financial aid to the Palestinians since they refused to come to the negotiating table. Palestinians, however, say that they are being punished for something Trump himself did and accuse him of effectively ending the negotiations with his recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. هذا هو الأمر الأساسي التي تطلع إليه الإدارة الأمريكية أولا فيما يسمى صفقة القرن هي تأتي في سياق شطب الحقوق الفلسطينية أعلن الرئيس ترامب عن القدس عاصمة الاحتلال وهو لا يملك هذا الحق وخارج إطار كل قرارات الشرعية الدولية والقانون الدولي في محاولة شطب القدس أن تكون عاصمة أبدية لدولة فلسطين وستبقى هذه القدس هي العاصمة لدولة فلسطين the PLO also says that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is more likely the brains behind the United States' latest budget slash. And though the State Department says it is not aimed at punishing anyone, Human Rights Group says it will devastate the millions of Palestinians who qualify as refugees all over the world, many of whom still live in refugee camps in Lebanon, Jordan, Gaza, and Syria. United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres is especially concerned that this new pressure will escalate the region to new violence, even war. First of all, UNRWA is not a Palestinian institution. UNRWA is a UN institution created by, uh, in uh, um, 48, if I, sorry? Yeah. No, but I mean, in 48, 40, yeah. uh, um, uh, yeah. by a UN resolution, and UNRWA is providing vital services to the uh, Palestinian refugee population both in the occupied territories and in Jordan, uh, in uh, Syria, and uh, in uh, um, Lebanon. Uh, those services are of extreme importance, not only for the well-being of these populations, and there is a serious humanitarian concern here, uh, but also, in my opinion, and the opinion that is shared by most uh, international observers, including some Israeli ones, it is an important factor of stability. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas made a long speech from Ramallah yesterday, outlining in part that the Palestinians will reject all United States mediation in future peace negotiations. Abbas then went on to reject the proposed idea of a Palestinian state with Abu Dis as its capital. Abu Dis is a large Palestinian town just outside of Jerusalem. Al-Quds University is also located there. It was not confirmed from whom the peace deal came from, but speculation and related comments infer that the deal comes from the United States. Now, aside from the fact that Abbas says he finds the idea offensive, he also made it clear that he will not be taking any deal from the United States anyway, after Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Abbas is now scheduled to look elsewhere for a backer in brokering a two-state solution, with several nations already trying to take the lead. Israel has consistently denied multilateral initiatives in the past, however, seeking direct negotiations instead. Well, with peace between Israel and the Palestinians seemingly further away than ever before, the Palestinians are preparing to take drastic measures. The top council of Palestinian leaders have just voted to totally withdraw recognition of the state of Israel and are urging the PLO to follow suit by cementing it into policy. This is a massive vote that may very well mark the beginning of a new Palestinian strategy as we know it. اثنين تخليف اللجنة التنفيذية لمنظمة التحرير الفلسطينية بتعليق الاعتراف بإسرائيل إلى حين اعترافها بدولة فلسطين على حدود عام 67 وإلغاء قرار ضم القدس الشرقية ووقف الاستيطان ثلاثة يجدد المجلس المركزي قراره بوقف التنسيق الأمني بكافة أشكاله 
Though the final decision is still for PA President and PLO Chairman Mahmoud Abbas to make, Abbas just delivered a fiery speech on the matter, demanding the international community to step in and mediate peace while also apparently denying any Jewish connection to the land of Israel. Some of Abbas's troubling accusations echo similar anti-Semitic claims he made decades ago. Prime Minister Netanyahu says that Abbas has merely exposed a truth Israel already knew, that the root of the conflict is the basic refusal to recognize a Jewish state in any borders. Others say Abbas has no other choice than to revert to extreme language to rally his base, given the Palestinian frustration over President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. A decision seen by some as the beginning of the end of Palestinian dreams for an independent state. Meanwhile, the case of the teenage Palestinian girl Ahmed Tamimi continues to spark debate. A military judge has just ruled to keep the 16-year-old in jail in the days leading up to her court hearing, despite admitting that the girl poses no actual threat. Tamimi has become an icon of Palestinian resistance for slapping an Israeli soldier who allegedly shot her younger cousin in the head with a rubber bullet. Footage of the incident went viral, and though some praised the soldiers for not fighting back, others say Tamimi staged the attack in hopes of capturing a violent response. She's charged with several counts of aggravated assault. Israel has just decided to ban all Hamas members and their families from visiting Israel for humanitarian purposes. This includes all trips to Israeli prisons and hospitals, regardless of whether or not the visitors in question are directly associated with Hamas activity. This is widely seen as a move by the Israeli government to pressure the terror group into releasing the bodies of fallen IDF soldiers Hadar Goldin and Oron Shaul. Hamas is believed to be holding their bodies in the Gaza Strip since Israel's 2014 operation. Operation Protective Edge. In fact, the government approved this ban based on petitions from the Goldin family who have been urging the government to take action in returning their son's body to Israel. The Knesset's policy also unwinds an earlier court ruling which said that Israel is not allowed to hold on to the bodies of fallen Hamas soldiers, even though Hamas continues to hold Israeli bodies. The humanitarian ban has not yet taken full effect, though, and Israel's high court still needs to give the final green light. Light. Rights groups, including the Red Cross, say Israel is bound by international law to allow prisoners' families to visit them, as well as make hospital visits, especially considering that Palestinians must clear a long, difficult per permitting process to cross into Israel for any reason at all. But the Israeli government clearly sees the ban as a necessary step in restarting negotiations for a favorable prisoner exchange, which has been at a total standstill for years now. Israel says that it has just totally destroyed a new terror tunnel believed to be used by Hamas in southern Gaza. Unlike past tunnels discovered and destroyed by the IDF, this one is astonishing in both its sophistication and build, and the fact that it extended hundreds of meters into Israel as well as into Egypt. This is the third terror tunnel destroyed by Israel in as many months. Perhaps not so ironically, the tunnel ran underneath Kerem Shalom Crossing, where hundreds of trucks cross in and out of Gaza every day, carrying humanitarian supplies. The IDF shut down the Kerem Shalom checkpoint in order to launch its operation. Unlike past tunnel demolitions, Israeli jets pummeled the tunnel inside Gaza borders from above. Though Hamas denies the tunnel was used for terror, Israeli intel says otherwise, especially considering it extended all the way into Egypt, where weapons could easily be smuggled through. <laughs> יש מי שאומר שצהל תוקף דיונות של חול, זה לא נכון. אנחנו מגיבים על התקיפות נגד מדינת ישראל, אנחנו עושים את זה בתקיפה מאוד שיטתית של התשתיות שמכוונות נגדנו, והחמאס צריך להבין שלא נרשה את המשך ההתקפות הללו, ושנגיב בעוצמה עוד יותר גדולה. Top IDF officials confirmed that this was, quote, a significant asset, and even say that more tunnel demolitions are on the way. Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman has perhaps said it best, though, saying, quote, The message to the leader of Gaza and its citizens is clear. Invest in the sanctity of life and not in digging your own catacombs, end quote. Despite repeated criticism and promises to withdraw the United States from the Iran nuclear deal, President Trump has just re-signed the waiver officially keeping the deal alive. Iran is hailing this as a victory over the United States, but Trump himself says that this is the last time he'll sign the deal unless it can be fixed before the next deadline. 
یکی دو هفته اخیر آمریکایا در دو بخش دوچار شکست بزرگ شدن یک بخش اونجا که خواستند در برابر افکار عمومی جهان بیستند و تعهدات بین المللی را زیر پا بگذارند Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has been one of the few world leaders to join Trump in condemning the deal, claiming that Iran has violated the spirit of the agreement. The deal lifts economic sanctions on Iran in exchange for Tehran agreeing to halt its nuclear development program. But Israeli leaders say Iran is determined to develop nuclear weapons by any means necessary. Intelligence has indeed suggested Iran may still be pursuing its nuclear program, but United Nations watchdogs have so far been unable to find any such evidence. Iran remains one of Israel's fiercest enemies, consistently funding terror against the Jewish state, and a nuclear-armed Iran would definitely be the culmination of Israel's biggest fears. But the majority of the world's leaders say the nuclear deal is the only thing that's kept Iran from becoming a North Korea, which did develop nuclear weapons despite international sanctions. The only reason why the Trump administration is still in the Iran nuclear deal, is still a part of the Iran nuclear deal, is because the entire rest of the world, except for Israel and Saudi Arabia, have told the Trump administration, if you leave the deal, you will be isolated. So what they're trying to do is figure out a way to stay in the deal long enough while making sure that Iran does not get the economic benefits so that it forces Iran to walk away so that they can blame Iran for the deal's failure rather than America getting the blame. Netanyahu and Trump, however, argue that that's exactly what will happen if the deal remains in its current form. Now, here's another twist in the case of the teenage Palestinian girl who was arrested for slapping IDF soldiers last month. Despite admitting that 16-year-old Ahmed Tamimi posed no actual threat, an Israeli military court has just ruled that she will remain in police custody until her trial ends. She's now been in prison for over a month. Uh, regretfully, the court didn't accept any of the arguments brought by the defense regarding the fact that there are two different sets of laws in the occupied territories depending if you are uh, Israeli or Palestinian and the fact that the, that the convention of the rights of the child should be applied in the occupied territories as well. 16-year-old Tamimi was arrested in overnight raids after video footage went viral of her and a cousin slapping IDF soldiers stationed near her home. In what some say was an apparent attempt to capture a violent reaction from the soldiers on tape. The incident fiercely split debates, with some saying the soldiers should be praised for not striking back, and others calling the soldiers weak for remaining passive. Tamimi testified in court, however, that she slapped the soldier after witnessing him shoot her younger cousin in the head with a rubber bullet. Pictures of Tamimi's young cousin suffering from major head wounds and deformities were offered as testimony. Tamimi quickly became an iconic symbol of Palestinian resistance. Israel's decision to keep the teen in custody until her trial finishes seems to be only adding to her fame. Israeli press speculate that she may soon become the Palestinian Joan of Arc. Tamimi soon faces multiple counts of aggravated assault in an Israeli military court. The Knesset's controversial mini-market bill became Israeli law last week. The legislation now makes it illegal for most businesses all over the country to remain open during the Shabbat weekend. And now a taped recording has just leaked to the media, igniting a whole new debate on the matter. That's because it details how the government plans to enforce this controversial idea. And ILTV's Aaron Porras is here with this story. So, Aaron, how is this bill going to be enforced? Uh, well, we'll get to more of the exact details in my report, but honestly, it's a bit of a mess and it's kind of hard to, to really answer that accurately. You know, people from, the plan right now is that people from one organization uh, who are in charge of actually monitoring deportees, uh, deportations and asylum seekers, etc., will be retrained in order to enforce this bill, and then people from, you know, from outside of the organization or even from random citizens will then be ha having to be trained to fill in that gap, and it's really just... People are saying, you know, opponents are saying it's a monumental waste of money. It's just, it's, you know, but I think... And it has the potential to divide the country even exactly, more, it seems. Exactly, exactly. It has, a, you know, for a number of reasons, too. You know, number one, primary backer of this bill, Minister Ari Adeli, the interior minister, who now, you know, earlier said, I'll quit if this bill doesn't get passed. And now he's saying, no, the secular uh, Israelis are, are so against this that I'm not going to enforce it. Then you mm -hmm. have... Moshe Gafni, who is another MK, who uh, in the recording you just mentioned that was just released, is saying very, uh, 
very ostensibly, I wanted to push this bill to help the religious and not the secular, and to and to improve the status quo for the religious. So, it really is just dividing people divisive. more and more and more. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear some more details in your report. All right. The recording was apparently captured during a private meeting with ultra-Orthodox Knesset member Moshe Gaffney, who tells his audience that Prime Minister Netanyahu personally agreed to take hundreds of inspectors tasked with forcibly detaining African asylum seekers and retrain them with upholding the new Shabbat law. These inspectors are reportedly all non-Jewish, and the announcement comes mere days after the government announced it would pay up to $9,000 to Israeli citizens to help enforce the deportation of those said African asylum seekers. Critics of both plans say that the government is wasting millions of dollars by retraining these workers for a skill they're not at all ideal for, and then paying twice by having average Israeli citizens fill in the gap. On top of that, the mini-market bill is criticized as a potentially devastating blow to Israel's economy on its own, since it will shutter countless businesses on the weekend. But the Knesset member on the tape says that the law moves the needle forward for the country's religious status quo and even confirmed that as the head of the Finance Committee, he refused to approve the government's budget for 2019 unless Netanyahu gave in to ultra-Orthodox demands. But perhaps the biggest red flag of all is that he told the audience not to share what was said in the meeting, saying that it could, quote, cause damage. The Israeli government is always looking to the future, and it looks like they're starting to take digital currency, known as cryptocurrencies, very seriously. The finance ministry has just ordered Israeli regulators to evaluate the potential of cryptocurrencies and how Israel might someday completely switch over to fully digitalized money. Digital currencies like Bitcoin have been making a massive splash lately, and the Knesset has even been toying with a digital shekel to replace cash in the country. The government clearly sees this as a way of the future, and the initiative has been spearheaded by opposition leader Isaac Herzog. That's why the committee is requesting a new set of guidelines to monitor, tax, and understand the potential of cryptocurrency in the Israeli market. Just last month, Prime Minister Netanyahu even predicted that banks themselves would soon go obsolete in the wake of digital money. But regulators are anxious about the idea in general because of the legal gray zone that cryptocurrency currently inhabits. Digital money is often used by money launderers, tax evaders, and even terrorists to conceal funds. But if cryptocurrency is truly the future of banking, governments all over the world, including Israel, will be tasked with building a legal framework and upgrading the country's infrastructure to the next level. So you're coming to Israel and want a quick weekend getaway but don't want to spend too much money, right? You don't want to actually fly anywhere or do anything too crazy. Well, then a weekend festival is the best option, no? Here in the Holy Land, we have many to choose from, so I'm here to give you the top five festivals to check out. At number one, we have the Midburn Festival, Burning Man's Israeli branch, which is now actually the second largest regional Burning Man. Midburn is a five-day art, self-expression, and community festival held in the Negev, founded back in 2014. Everyone involved brings their own extravagant artwork to be displayed in the center of the festival, and on the final night, the temple filled with art is burned to the ground. Definitely an annual festival you won't want to miss. Number two on our list is the Tamal Festival, a five-day celebration of some of Israel's most loved musicians. Founded back in 2000, the festival is held during Sukkot in venues surrounding Masada. You can find the main performances to be held either late at night or at sunrise. You have your choice of setting up tents and camping around the festival or checking into a local hostel. Either way, it's an experience of a lifetime. Third on our list is the Neverland Electronic Music Festival, a massive 24-hour non-stop electronics festival founded back in 2011, held on the banks of the Jordan River in northern Israel, making it perfect to camp out. All you gotta do is grab your ticket and get ready for a very intense 24 hours. Now fourth on our list is the Indie Negev Music Festival, founded back in 2007 and held annually in the Negev. This three-day live music festival has over 100 live shows from Israel's top up-and-coming bands. While the name speaks for itself, a lot of groups performing come from the indie music genre, while there's also a wide spectrum of other genres as well. If you're around mid-October, this is definitely the place to be for a quick weekend adventure. Last on our list is the Zolba Buddha Festival, Israel's largest hippie festival, which happens twice a year in the Negev. Founded back in 2003, this five-day festival is a combo festival integrating spirituality, dance, meditation, and yep, you guessed it, music. Deep yoga, meditation, movement, and music can all be found here, all while meeting amazing, open-hearted people connecting with nature. Definitely the best way to relax, enjoy, and zen out. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you.
That's it for this week's Roundup. Tune in next Friday for our next episode of This Week in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv.